Atheist Nomads, episode 114, news for October 1, 2015. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low-price, full-featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A-R-C-H-W-A-Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash atheist nomads. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo haws. Please be advised. We are the Atheist Nomads bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Oh, the frustrated Wesley. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing all right. What's got you all frustrated? Oh, man. I've been sitting in the local courts for the last couple of days to be on a on a, a, a case. I was going to be in the jury, not in the defendant's box. Definitely better than being a defendant. Yeah, especially in this case. Uh, but uh, no, <laughs> can't really tell you guys about it. But uh, yeah, I was in the actual jury box all today. And then the the DA just got rid of me without without cause. Huh. Was, there was a tear. <laughs> oh, wow. You got released just for for being a sensitive person uh no Maybe. i wanted to i wanted to like be sensitive upside his head though goodness <laughs> <laughs> man yeah uh, but uh i actually tell the clerk to put me on the short list to invite me back every year right on the right on the same dot so oh, nice it's kind of cool so yeah four years running i've been in the pool but never in the box oh until this time yeah lauren's not joining us she's uh her health hasn't been the greatest, so she's still not hmm. feeling all that well. So, yeah, hopefully soon we'll be able to get to the bottom of all of it. Cool. Maybe I'll have to have Meredith on soon. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, and yeah, so let's see, tomorrow I will be, uh, well, actually today uh, for a day of release, uh, I'll be walking in uh, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society's Light the Night on the Treasure Valley Coalition of Reason team. Sweet. Uh, this is a cause that, you know, raising money for, you know, an organization does a lot for leukemia and lymphoma patients and funds a lot of research. And it's, it's, of course, a case that is very near and dear to my heart as the son of a lymphoma survivor myself. So go ahead and click the link in the show notes and uh, be generous. And uh, speaking of, you know, my parents, since it was my mom who was the one who survived uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma, um... I found out talking to her this weekend that my parents have been listening to the show. <laughs> so, hi, mom and dad. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> they uh, particularly were enjoying. They hadn't gotten all the way through it yet, but the uh, the interview last week with uh, Jamela, uh -oh. who they'd met before. Oh, sweet! And uh, the uh, coverage on the Great Disappointment. Thought I did really good with that. So, sorry about all that swearing that Dustin does. It's horrible. <laughs> now, as a, a, a just to get this on the record, <laughs> I will not be censoring myself. So, because I don't think my parents would want to be listening if I was, although I don't know why they want to since I don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Yep. And show notes for this episode can be found at atheistnomads.com slash 114. Hmm. So there's a, a pattern there. It's the it's atheistnomads.com slash the episode number. Yep. That, that will always work. So let's go ahead and get into today's special topic. We're uh, picking up after the Great Disappointment. Uh, the Millerites, or at this point, uh, they were more commonly called Adventists, were a very disjointed group that was distrustful of church structure and denominational organizations. But what they did have was local congregations, sometimes a little bit more formal than others, and any church property would usually be titled in the name of the head elder. Hmm. And then they had roving pastors. They just kind of do a preaching circuit and occasionally get together for camp meetings. Okay, kind of like the Baptists do. And early on, they had problems with men showing up to preach, taking money from the congregation when they really didn't have any business doing either. 
So a few of these traveling preachers were identified as leading ministers with the authority to ordain others. This way, everybody who came to preach was either known to the churches or was signed off by somebody they knew. And most notable of these leading ministers were James White and Joseph Bates. We'll be hearing those, those names more. <laughs> All right, throw forward. There was also a 17-year-old girl who started having visions at a Bible study in 1844. So literally right after the Great Disappointment. And she helped them explain the cause of this disappointment. They had the right date and the right event, just the wrong location. So instead of Jesus coming to cleanse the earth, he entered the heavenly sanctuary to start the work of atonement. But we'll go more into this another time. This girl was Ellen Harmon, and she and James White, one of the leading ministers, met in 1845, and he was very quickly convinced that she had a prophetic gift, and they started traveling the preaching circuit together. And then in 1846, they got married, and one of the reasons was so they could cut down on hotel costs while traveling. With time, the loose group consolidated beliefs, with each consolidation also causing a split or losing people to other groups. One of these early beliefs was what day to worship on. Joseph Bates came across a track from a Millerite preacher, Thomas Preble, about the Seventh-day Sabbath, and Preble had been convinced of this by a Seventh-day Baptist. That is the only relationship between Seventh-day Adventists and Seventh-day Baptists, is literally that one little bit of influence right there. Uh, there is a lot closer relationship with regular Baptists. Uh, Bates was convinced, and then he worked uh, to convince everybody else. This gained acceptance, and when James White published the first edition of the church's new publication, The Present Truth, the main topic was the Sabbath, and this was in July 1849, not even four years after the Great Disappointment. The other beliefs that gained acceptance across the movement were soul sleep, where you cease to exist in any form when you die until the resurrection, and only those who are saved get immortality, and also a belief in premillennialism. That's where Jesus comes prior to the millennium and takes everybody back to heaven, as opposed to postmillennialists, where you spend a thousand years with Christ ruling over you on earth and then go to heaven. And Ellen White's acceptance as a prophet also greatly increased in these early days. And one of the key things that kept them cohesive was James White's printing press and the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald periodical that replaced the present truth. And this magazine is still going today under the name Adventist World and also Adventist Review. Uh, Review is now the uh, paid subscription and the Adventist World is the free one they send out to everybody. And in 1863, the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists formally incorporated in Battle Creek, Michigan, a move that was resisted by just about everyone, but made necessary by some elders leaving the movement and taking church buildings with them, buildings they technically owned, and the fact that the printing press the church relied on so much was officially the personal property of James White. Next time, we will focus more on the leadership of this early church. Okay, let's be honest. The main focus is going to be on Ellen White. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I'm starting to recognize names. It's great. <laughs> yes. Uh, before long, we will be getting to names that, well, at least one name that there's a school named after mm. that I have attended. Ooh. And actually, my uh, youth group leader in my church growing up, he was the great grandson of James and Ellen White. Mm. And his dad was a pastor who had a infidelity scandal that he was forgiven of. Of course. Likely because he was the grandson of James and Ellen White. Well, yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> this day in history, October 1st, 1964. The Japanese Shinkansen, or what everybody calls the bullet trains, begin their high-speed rail service from Tokyo to Osaka. So, yeah, I spent a year and a half over in Japan. I used to love the trains over there. So, yeah, deal with it. Uh, <laughs> uh, Shinkansen actually means new trunk line, which is just basically saying, hey, we got more trains, for new trains. Here they are. Uh, but, yeah, uh, the network uh, it just basically goes everywhere. All of the train lines are just amazing. The ma uh, maximum operating speed is actually kind of cool. 
It's uh, 320 uh, kilometers an hour, which is 200 miles an hour. Uh, Holy crap. Though there are some s- sections that go much faster. That's fast. It's fast. But uh, conventional rail in 1996 uh, have uh, reached up to 443 kilometers an hour, which is 275 MPH. But uh, they've got some maglev uh, sections of train that they're like experimenting with for like world records and shit. And that got up to 603 uh, kilometers an hour, which is 375 MPH. Wow. So, yeah, these guys' trains are no joke. I mean, uh, just the uh, the Tokaido Shinkansen is the world's busiest high-speed rail line that you know carries like 151 million passengers per year. So, yeah. Anybody who says that, that trains wouldn't work in the U.S. because of the distances, if we had trains that fast... They would yeah. work even out west. Oh, yeah. They you would know, work quite well. I mean, the BART down in the Bay Area Rapid Transit down in the Bay Area of California is a, you know, just a, a marvel. And they make it work. People use that all the time. But that's man. also just a, a metropolitan train. That uh, is, but it goes really far. Amtrak's the, uh, you know, the major passenger rail service, and it doesn't get a whole lot of business. It doesn't uh, get much at all, but, you know, it really needs some funding for a shitload of updates. Now, I know they are working on a high-speed train from L.A. to San Francisco. Okay. To start. If you can get it faster than driving and cheaper than flying, it'll take off. As long as you got good parking. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Seriously, definitely. That, that's the big thing. Like, centralized parking right next to the right next to the rails. Yeah, people will use it. And tied in with other public transit systems so you don't even have to drive. Yeah. Or you just go to your local park and ride, hop on a a little shuttle bus to a train that takes you to the train that's going to get you to where you want to go real quick. Yeah, it ain't bad. Yeah. 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 Uh, Trains in Japan, though, they're, I mean, they're everywhere. Every, every neighborhood has at least one train stop. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, there's tons of trains just going hither to, you know, just all fast and slow and all speeds in between so you know they're even color-coded for speed <laughs> kind of weird oh, nice. uh, the black uh the black trains are the fastest the green ones are the slowest that's you know the green ones stop at every stop so you, you know you if you need to go a, a, a long distance hop on the black one to to go really fast and it only hits the the major stops then you get off and hop on a green a blue or a red to get to one of the smaller stops yeah it's it's simple and it just works. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Nice. We need something like that for sure. Oh, yes. Anyways, write your congressman. <laughs> Anyways, moving on along. Oh, this one's a good one. This day in history, 1989, Denmark introduces the first legal modern same sex civil union called Registered Partnership. Okay, this one's just cool. I mean, I can't really find a lot in English on this, but I found a PDF that reads it all out. The Registered Partnership Act. So we, Margaretha II, by the grace of God, Queen of Denmark, do make known that the Danish folk talking has passed the following act, which has received the royal assent. Two persons of the same sex may have their partnership registered. And with that, on October wow. 1st, that was the first day that it took effect. You could essentially get married and same sex in, in Denmark. Holy shit. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, same legal effects of marriage. So this was the first separate but equal and a huge step forward. Oh, yeah. And what's interesting is, you know, we have a secular government here with laws enacted on behalf of the people. And this is a monarchy where god is actually in the first line of the act (laughs) and they got there a lot faster than we did i still have something to say that you know if uh if a country has a a a religion a state religion i I think they kind of get to being a secular nation way quicker way easier well it's it's not really that simple because Religion hurt a lot in Europe during because of World War II. They saw very firsthand how bad things can be and how could any God allow that. Whereas in the U.S., 
not a lot of people saw that firsthand. Yeah, there was millions, but let's be honest here. It we is women really who take keep, damage. Women are who keep religion going. Yeah. When women go, they drag their husbands along <laughs> and they get their children to go. And so, you know, you look at, at church attendance in the U.S., on average, churches are two thirds women in attendance. Great way to meet women. Tell you what, you single guys. <laughs> <laughs> and so because we didn't send a lot of women over to Europe to see World War II firsthand, we were insulated from that. And yes, there is also the fact that you get a lot more variety of religion when it's a free, a true free market. And with that, you get a lot of competition. <sighs> well, so this next one, really near and dear to my heart and my paycheck. Uh, <laughs> this day in history, 2013, the U.S. federal government shuts down non-essential services like me after is unable to pass a budget measure. So, yeah, um, you might have heard of this. You might have not. I know in my circles, it was definitely well, well discussed. Uh, during the shutdown of federal government employees, approximately 800,000 federal employees were indefinitely furloughed and another 1.3 million were required to report to work without known payment dates. Uh, it, didn't you start out in that first category and then got moved to the second? Uh, I was actually, I was just always in the first category. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Basically my entire base of 10, 11,000 employees were almost all of them were in that first category. Uh, we didn't know if we were going to get paid or not. Uh, but yeah, we were all straight furloughed. Uh, this, that shutdown was, uh, 16 days long and it was the third longest in shutdown history. And, you know, it was actually the, the first since back in 95, 96 had a 21 day shutdown. So yeah, long ass gap, but you know, man, they shut down like the one that might happen tomorrow, uh, is basically because of Republicans. Uh, this one from 2013 was, uh, really, re uh, due to Ted Cruz and other conservative groups. And they were kind of, uh, there, there was a big stink between all of them trying to, uh, get Obamacare repealed or, and to get it, get it gone. And, uh, that was their, their, uh, horse in that race. Like, uh, get rid of Obamacare or we're fucking shutting it all down. Uh, needless to say that didn't work and we still have the affordable care act. Hooray. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Uh, fucking dicks. So yeah, I might be out of a job tomorrow again. Yeah. There is a continuing resolution that's been uh, proposed that would push it off until December for, for the next time it has to come up, yeah. which would allow John Boehner to compromise and work with Democrats to at least keep the government open now and then not be around for the next one. <laughs> yeah. It, I know it, it, there is a, a possibility that they'll delay it until like mid December. But, uh, as of right now, we're told to report to work tomorrow morning and we'll, we're going to be told if we have to turn right back around and go home or not. So yeah. Yay. Wow. <laughs> shitty but uh yeah it took uh, i think two paychecks and then uh the government like retroactively paid us for all the time that we missed so sorry but y'all paid us to not work but uh yeah let's see what happens this time yay well and when you look at the the impact that have that was horribly destructive to the economy oh goodness but on like some microeconomic scales Bremerton, that would have been absolutely devastating to the local economy there, having, what, a quarter of the population out of work? Well, granted that, you know, people do come from miles and towns away, but, uh, yeah, I mean, Bremerton's like uh, 36 or 37,000 people, kind of depending on what boats are in. So, yeah, having up to one third of your population, you know, just instantly out of work, yeah, mm -hmm. that, that hurts. <laughs> Especially since that's the portion of the population that's directly, you know, putting all the money into the economy in the first place there. Yeah. And, you know, Washington has quite a few naval bases. Uh, 
California, along the East Coast. Yeah, lots of towns that depend on shit like this. And mm-hmm. Republicans giving zero fucks and just shutting the shit down. Wow. Because they want to repeal something that helps helps poor people. Yeah. Oh, and this time it's all about whether or not Planned Parenthood can get hmm. continue to get Medicaid reimbursement. Yeah. Zero cents goes to abortions. Zero federal dollars go to that. So And they call it federal subsidies. Hmm. It's not. It's government sponsored insurance paying for medical services. It shouldn't be treated any different in that regard than any other clinic. It's it's absolutely insane. Ah, man. Ew. We're going to take a quick break and then we will be back with science. We love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com, tweet us at atheistnomads, send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads, or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. The biggest science news we have, pretty freaking awesome, NASA has announced that there is liquid water on Mars. But don't get too excited about this. They've been watching dark streaks on some of the equatorial slopes that get longer and then disappear during the warmer months, and have now detected salt percolates, which means that a very salty brine is flowing down these slopes. Unfortunately, the cause is still unknown. The source could be melting underground ice deposits, or as the team prefers, the percolates could be absorbing humidity from the atmosphere. Hmm. All right, so kind of like a dehumidifier, just kind of sucking the the water out of the air, possibly, or ice. Okay. Either way, I think this is amazing, first. Second, it's going to make it so much easier to like build a habitable zone, uh, you know, to, to put people on Mars, you know, not having to transport water or at least nearly as much would be a giant boon to the, to the exploring. Well, and one of the things that it shows is that you do have sufficiently warm temperatures, at least in some areas, part of the year for liquid water, which means you have sufficient temperatures for plants. Oh, and one other thing, water makes a great um, shield, you know, Mm -hmm. not having to transport like as much lead or other heavy metals to to help block uh, uh, particles from space would be another awesome feature. Yeah. Now, realistically, to get sufficient quantities, they'd probably have to go to the polar regions and mine the ice. But damn, this would be this would be pretty freaking awesome. Well, I mean, that's always kind of been the. The plan is to like send compartments and like uh, robotics things there first to kind of set everything up. So maybe they could plan something, plan an, an expedition to go out there and yeah. autom- automate the process a while. Oh, I definitely think that any kind of of uh, long term mission, you've got to send a, a robotic three D printer, like yeah. a mining three D printer that can mine the materials, build everything. The stuff that you have to send, it can construct it or assemble it. And yeah, have robots get it all set up so that we show up and it's all ready for us. That'd be kind of cool. Even with plants growing. 3D print some houses. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Mars has iron. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It has, has resources we could use. We could also, if we could get the stuff to Mars, we could probably, or at least we'll, by that time, um, we'd be able to capture a a uh, asteroid and use that as well so we've got we'll we'll have options it's called the red planet for a reason (laughs) shit yeah there there is iron (laughs) yeah Mm. and moving to uh more terrestrial uh equatorial regions in an isolated village in the dominican republic it is common for children who were assigned female at birth to become men at puberty this is caused by genetic mutation that causes the 5A reductase enzyme to be missing during fetal development, and this enzyme would normally trigger the production of large quantities of dihydrotestosterone, which would then result in the development of primary sex characteristics. Hmm. Since the babies are born without a penis or descended testicles, and usually at home, 
they are presumed to be female. Many wow. will go through their childhoods feeling like boys, acting more like boys, and generally not fitting, fitting in with the gender they were assigned at birth. Then at the start of puberty, with the production of large amounts of testosterone, they grow penises and develop into men. This is common enough that the village have a term for these men, Gueva doses, or penis at 12. <laughs> and while this is celebrated in this Dominican village, the phenomena has also been found in Papua New Guinea, where they are shunned as flawed men. Oh, fuck. Well, I, that's kind of checked up, but uh, at least Dominican Republic has the right idea. At least this, this one village. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry, yeah. Yeah, this is this has been known about since the 1970s, and they've actually been, you know, learning, gleaning information that can be used for uh, medicines. Um, one that was was created from it by uh, Merrick is finasteride, which blocks the action of 5A reductase and is used to treat uh, benign enlargement of the prostate and also male pattern baldness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and one other interesting thing is uh, some of these men actually keep the name they had when they were thought to be girls. Mm, cool. So you'll find men named Catherine there. <laughs> there's a, there's another term for them. Uh, Mushimbras, uh, which means uh, first woman, then man. For the first time ever, a biofluorescent reptile has been found. This is a sea turtle from the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific that was unexpectedly caught on camera by a scientist filming small sharks and the coral reefs. Hmm. Now, I, now I'm kind of curious. I mean, does it always glow or does it have to like eat other things that glow? Kind of like, um, I thought there was like some fish that do that. So bioluminescence is when they produce their own light through chemical reactions. Okay. This is biofluorescence which is when they absorb light, transform it, and radiate it out, sometimes in different colors. Hmm. But this is, yeah, never been seen with a reptile. It's quite surprising and uh, it brings up a whole lot of questions. Like, why and how? Why? Because it's cool and it attracts mates, I'm sure. And David Gruber of the City University of New York was the one who, who found this. And he first described it as an alien spaceship. <laughs> yeah, obviously. I just go for the aliens. It's, yeah. Okay. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We're going to take another quick break, and we will be back with politics and religion. Aliens did it. <laughs> as a listener of the show, I'm going to assume you love my sexy vocal stylings. If you love the rest of the show as much as my voice, consider giving us the resources we desperately need to purchase quality cocaine and Red Bull. We make it super easy to make a one-time donation or to support us on a per episode, monthly, or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon. Find out more at atheistnomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. A dollar an episode is all we ask. Pope Francis has completed his trip of the to the U.S., and I'm sure you're all tired about hearing about it, but there are some important issues. He visited the White House, which wouldn't have been too big of a deal if he had just met with the president, but no, he spoke to a crowd from the presidential podium at the White House, effectively giving his religious message as the head of a major religion the presidential seal of approval, quite literally. He then uh, spoke to a joint session of Congress, which is quite inappropriate no matter how you look at it. If you spoke to them as the king of the Vatican City, then a foreign head of state addressed the U.S. Congress, something that should not happen since that is foreign affairs and it is the exclusive domain of the president. And while I can't verify this, I do seem to recall when Netanyahu came and visited earlier this year, that was the first time a foreign head of state had addressed Congress. And there was a big stink about it. Uh, if he spoke to them instead as the Bishop of Rome, then they were allowing one religion exclusive access to preach to our secular Congress. And I know Republicans have stopped pretending to care about church-state separation, but come on! You know, he was speaking to Congress, and, you know, 
go figure the, the pope's catholic and well so is 30 percent plus of our of our congress so yeah he was addressing his followers in in congress it's kind of sick and a lot of people who weren't catholic yeah it would have been just fine for him to go to nearby catholic cathedral and invite catholic congressmen but nope john boehner had to invite him to come preach <laughs> in the house chambers ah man he uh, wrapped up his trip to the u.s with an address at the united nations general assembly i could almost understand this if the holy see was a u.n member but they have opted to just hold observer status and yes about one in six people in the world are counted as catholics but what about the other six billion people Fortunately, Shakira followed him up singing John Lennon's Imagine. I can't count how many atheist conferences I've been to and heard Imagine as like the one song that they all play. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, part of that song is definitely relevant to and ironic with this story. Uh, and I am going to play that little excerpt. And just remember that in the audience were the Pope and the heads of state and ambassadors from around the world. Imagine there's no heaven It's easy if you try No hell below us Above us, only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Thing to kill or die for a new religion too. So I'm kind of wondering if uh, Shakira's hips didn't lie to the Pope. It's a, it's a song <laughs> title. Yeah. Um, yeah. But and John Lennon had nothing to to even worry about Shakira singing this. Nope. That's shit. That song was, you know, the, the reason why you hear it at so many conferences is because the song is basically the humanist message. Yeah. And to have that from the, the, the platform at the UN General Assembly, that's pretty freaking awesome. Yeah. You know, if the Pope wasn't there, I would have been kind of cool with it. But, you know, she was there because of, of fucking Frankenbeans. Uh, maybe. Yeah. She's not, she was present as a UN goodwill ambassador. Sure, but was she even children. performing there if the Pope wasn't there? I doubt it. She was brought in as entertainment. That's possible. And if so, even more delicious. <laughs> Saying that instead of Ave Maria or something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she was raised Roman Catholic and attended Catholic schools. And has been quiet about her religious views for the last few years. So, Dustin, what do you say when a when a Baptist and a Catholic walk into a bar? They must be at the Vatican Embassy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, same day as the congressional address, the Pope and Kim Davis had a 15-minute meeting. Then, on his way back to Rome, the Pope was asked for his thoughts on Davis, and he told the reporter that he thinks that conscientious objection is a basic human right. In other words, that she has a right to not do her job. Now, I can agree to an extent, like when conscientious, conscientious objection to bearing arms in the military, since there are support roles that soldiers can fill. But when you refuse to do your job, you have a right to find a job that you can do. Yeah, Kim's Kim has already come out and said that she won't quit because if she does, she'll lose her voice. Yeah. Um, honestly, she's such a, a right wing darling now 
And mm -hmm. thank fucking Christ, she's not a Democrat anymore. She just registered Republican recently. But yeah, she's she's set for life oh, if yeah. she doesn't fuck it up. Yep. She was so, in D.C. not specifically to meet with the Pope. Um, she was getting an award from a right-wing religious conference. Yeah, great. Here's Some martyr award. Star. Here's your sign. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Get the fuck out of there. Goodness. But what really what I would say was the most disappointing thing with the Pope's visit, aside from the church-state separation issues all across the board, <laughs> were how many atheists were praising things the Pope was saying. Yeah. Oh, you know what? The man. dude can say whatever he wants to, but until, like, shit goes into action, until policy changes, they're just words. Yeah. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm sure the guy's nice. I'm sure he had a really interesting childhood listening to metal out in the hills. But you know what? The Pope wields a lot of fucking power if he wants to. Mm -hmm. He needs to. If he wants that change, if he wants to be the change, then he should be the fucking change. Yeah. And I've said it before. There are really only two things I want to see the Catholic Church do. And that's turn over child molesting priests to civil authorities yep. and say it's okay to use condoms in Africa. Oh, fucking I Wouldn't that be nice? That's it. I'm not asking for them to completely change their, their stance on contraceptives because that's being ignored by Catholics in the Western world. But stop helping spread HIV. Uh, one thing that I love is Republicans. You know, just a couple of years ago, you know, Pope's infallibility, just pap papal infallibility as, as usual, until he started speaking out about um, global warming recently. Mm -hmm. And now uh, Republicans are just straight turning on him. It's kind of funny. Oh, yeah. Ted Cruz has called for the Catholic hierarchy, the, the, the cardinals, to try to oust him. <laughs> yeah. Which I don't think they can do. I don't know. They'd have to do it with cyanide or something. Well, I'm sure they've done it before. Oh, yeah. It's been a while, but... Guarantee it. <laughs> yeah. All right, moving on. <laughs> yes. Kevin Francis Ramey of Togiak, Alaska, was charged with felony criminal non-support for being $84,000 behind in child support. God damn. My asshole father only got 20000 in debt. <laughs> At his arraignment, the former member of the... Togiak City Council was asked by the judge if he understood his rights. His response was based on the fact that he considers himself a sovereign citizen. Oh, goodness. And it is so crazy, you won't believe it unless you hear it for yourself. So let me play that for you. And it says if you're not a U.S. citizen, you could be deported. And I, I know I have three citizenships, number one in heaven, number two in America, number three in the California state, and uh, that's my primary citizenship is, is of course, in heaven. So, you know, I was kind of wondering, is, are you guys going to deport me to heaven? <laughs> I hope not. Right. So, um, is he just asking to be killed? That's, that's what that sounds like to me. I'm kind of fine with that, but that aside, dude's a fucking moron. Yeah, yeah, especially when you consider... If, if you ignore the heaven part, mm -hmm. citizen of the United States and Cal California. Citizen of California. Does does that mean that he was born in California? I would assume. Because I'm guessing he's lived in Alaska for a while. Uh-huh. Yeah, I was born in Oregon, but I have not had any rights as somebody who lives in Oregon since I moved to Washington. I'm going to assume that if he's a citizen of California, he shouldn't be getting that uh, a few thousand dollar oil check that all the Alaskans get. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, fucking moron. All right. <laughs> yeah, you've got one citizenship, and that is to the sovereign nation you live within. In his case, just like yours and mine, it's the United States. Ah, oh, man. Those people are, are crazy, and it really just comes down to they don't want to pay taxes. And he doesn't want to pay his child support, that fucking douche nozzle. Yeah. God. Which, yeah, that makes it even worse. So, yeah, man. And, and realistically, if there were a God and he was deported to heaven, 
Does he really think he would be accepted for neglecting his children? Yeah, seriously. I mean, take care of your kids. That's just pretty basic, you know, human decency. <laughs> that, that's not even human decency. That's just pretty, pretty basic for mammals. Even some reptiles. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh man. And this next one has a, a tie for me also. Yeah. 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 What? Uh, what, what, what hand is your dominant one? Well, I'm lefty and always was. However, my mother, uh, she was raised, well, she was uh righty until she got into her like second or third grade or something. And teacher kept on smacking her hand and made her a righty. Hmm. Yeah. That happened to my grandpa as well. He was wow. uh, left-handed until first grade. Nice. Yeah. God yeah. bless those wooden rulers. <laughs> yeah. So, uh. The mother of a four-year-old pre-K student at Oaks Elementary School in Oklahoma noticed her son doing homework with his right hand, despite doing everything else, including his homework the day before, with his left. As she tells it, I just asked, is there anything his teachers ever asked about his hands? And he raised this one and says, this one's bad. She sent a note with him for his teacher, and the teacher responded with an article about how left-handed people have been viewed as unlucky or sinister, and how it's associated with the devil and evil. The mother has now complained to the superintendent, but after they have failed to take any action, um, she is transferring her son to a different class and filing a complaint with the Oklahoma Board of Education. Unfortunately, nothing is going to come of this. It's just not. I mean, goodness. Just you. Yeah. <laughs> the kid is four. A left-handed kid getting told that he's a bad person, that his left hand is evil. What the fuck? I mean, a teacher shouldn't be doing that shit. She's, I mean, yes, uh, sinister uh, has left-handed connotations and goes back to like uh, Latin and there's even, uh, I think it was uh, Babylonian or, or or some other really old language that, you know, there's lefty, left-handed people have, you know, sinister or or evil well, uh, connotations. The, the, the reason, it's time to lose that shit. The real reason for, for that kind of a, a viewpoint is your left hand is a hand you wiped your ass with. It depends on the, depends on the people. Mus- Muslims are definitely... Uh, lefty wiping. Uh huh. In that way, the you can use your right hand for everything else, and it's always clean. And your left hand is always dirty. Yeah, your right hand's dirty too. Just saying. But what else? And <laughs> we have toilet paper and hygiene and sanitation. So there's no reason to be afraid that his left hand is covered in shit. <laughs> yeah, I I grew up with a, a Muslim friend who is a. Uh, he was he was in the Nigerian army and came over to the American army and so uh, you know anyways really good guy and <laughs> Nuru though man Nuru he he would uh take a shower every time he shit no shit oh wow yeah <laughs> <laughs> huh yeah there you go all right let's move on to the next one FFRF wrote a complaint letter to the Childress Texas Police Department over there in God we trust bumper stickers on their patrol cars oh yeah. Chief Adrian Garcia replied to Annie Laurie Gaylor with, Dear Annie, after carefully reading your letter, I must deny your request in the removal of our nation's motto from our patrol units and ask that you and the Freedom From Religion Foundation go fly a kite. Yes, go fly a kite. Seriously. Who the fuck says that? (laughs) I'm Uh, sure Chief Adrian Garcia had harsher language in mind. I'm sure. Owner Chief Adrian Garcia actually included some kites for them. That would, <laughs> that would at least be nice. Yes, that would have. Oh, man. Goodness. It's time to lose that fucking motto. Shouldn't have ever been put there in the first place. It really is. Now, I am kind of hoping that with it going to, you know, onto patrol cars, yeah. this will eventually go to lawsuit somewhere. And that would provide a. I think a little more direct opportunity to have standing in a suit against the national motto. All we need is one brave atheist, Muslim, or Jew to like speak up. Preferably a police officer. Hmm. 
Yeah, not going to happen. If not you're driving that Childress, car, Texas. you've got the most direct. It'd be impossible to say you don't have standing. But I would say if you live in the community and you see the police driving around with in God we trust and you don't believe in that God, that sends a bad message. Yep. Mm. Which kind of ties into the next story. Yes. We previously reported on the Houston County Sheriff's Office in Alabama putting Matthew 5, 9 decals on their patrol cars. Blessed are the cheesemakers. Oh, sorry. Peacemakers. Yeah. Yeah. Now, after taking a letter from Americans United to their liability insurance company, they have been told that they would lose in court and that the case would cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars. They removed Mm. the decals. Somebody should tell Sheriff Adrian. (laughs) Uh, Chief Adrian. (laughs) Eh, Whatever. Hired position versus elected. Uh, He still gets a whatever from me. (laughs) Oh, boy. Yeah. Hey, awesome. Well, I mean... That's got to be a lot. That's got to be a relief for, you know, the taxpayers of that community. <laughs> or at no, least some of them. A lot of them are probably uh, upset. A lot of them are, but, you know, all those fiscally conservative Republicans should be very happy. <laughs> but <Yeah>. they're not. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck them. <laughs> if they can't take a joke. Oh, boy. All right. Moving along. Adventist Health Systems is the corporation that owns and operates the Seventh-day Adventist Church's hospitals in the southern and midwestern U.S. This is not to be confused with Adventist Health, which operates the in the western U.S., or Adventist Healthcare, which operates in the mid-Atlantic. This is a, mm-hmm. a separate regional corporation. Separate but equal, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, it's the biggest of them all. Ah. And keeping with the current trend of hospitals buying up medical offices, Adventist Health Systems allegedly paid doctors in Florida, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Texas for referrals. Hmm. Some of these kickbacks, and yes, these are known as kickbacks, included paying the leases for a M- uh, paying the leases for a BMW and a Mustang for a surgeon and giving a $366,000 base salary for a family practice doctor, double the going rate in that area because of how many x-rays and CBCs he ordered. Nice. And also a dermatologist working only three days a week received an annual pay of $710,000, and they paid all of the cost for his practice for the last bit of time he was in private practice before the hospital took over the clinic. I don't know. Seems reasonable. 700000 These kickbacks are highly illegal since doctors should be making referrals based on what's best for the patient's care. And as a result, Adventist Health Systems has settled with the federal and state governments for $118.7 million. I got a feeling that's only a smack on the wrist, but I'm glad they did it. This is now the largest healthcare fraud settlement over referrals. I think the largest one ever was for Health uh, Hospital Corporation of America when it was being headed by Florida Governor Rick Scott. Oh, yeah. That for winner. Doing a lot of double billing of CBCs and other labs and double billing on x rays and adding on charges for stuff that wasn't done and extra days on hospital stays and all kinds of stuff to take a bunch of money from Medicare and Medicaid. Now, what's really funny with with this story, though, is that the Adventist Church considers medicine to be a ministry. (laughs) But apparently, it's a very corrupt and a very lucrative one at that. Well, money corrupts, right? Supposedly. Mm -hmm. And last week, during this year's Hajj, Muslims taking part in the ritual of stoning Satan began to stampede, killing at least 806 people and wounding at least 934. I say at least, these numbers could be significantly higher. This isn't the first time people have been crushed to death during this ritual, with the current record belonging to the 1990 disaster with 1,426 people killed. Saudi Arabia has been working to expand the spaces used in this phase of the Hajj and space people out over three days 
but they clearly have not done sufficient work to keep the pilgrims safe. I got nothing. <laughs> God damn. Yeah. All right, that's it for news. It's now time to move on to feedback. Letters. We got letters. And the first few are from Alf in Bangkok. Uh, he uh, sent us a news clipping that's pretty hilarious. It actually, no, it's not hilarious. A uh, man faces jail for living with woman. That's the, the headline. A Muslim man in Miramar was facing a possible jail term for allegedly living with a woman while he was still married to somebody else. He's a 37-year-old masonry worker. And this is all because Miramar has a monogamy law. Myanmar? Yeah. All right. Yeah, great. Well, I mean, that's not as awesome as a penis shrine, though. Which the next thing he sent us was the penis shrine that is in Bangkok, <laughs> a 10-minute walk from his condo. Yeah, because there's a penis shrine in Bangkok. Just, just saying. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's not subtle either. <laughs> it's a giant phallus with foreskin and wrinkles. <laughs> yeah. And there's other penises on the site, some of which appear to be circumcised. Hmm. Uh, the, uh, the main one is uh, 10 feet in height, three meters. It's draped in cloth and... Women leave offerings there, well, in the, the spirit house there, uh, in, in hopes of getting pregnant. Yeah, this is the Chow Me Tupum shrine over in Bangkok. But this, yeah, link in the show notes. Check it out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in, interestingly enough, phallic statues are actually very common in uh, early religions. This is a, a, based on a, a pre-Buddhist tree spirit. Like when I was in Jordan, I saw two giant standing stones at Petra. Basically, giant phalluses. Virtually every temple back in the old days, at least across you know large swaths of land, would have a standing stone out front, a giant phallus. <laughs> yeah. Mm. And from Tosca via email, hi guys, wanted to say I'm a frequent listener of your podcast. Keep up the good work. It's great to hear stories from you and your guests. Really liked so far one eleven with Alex Jules and two with Teresa McBain. I usually listen to it during some daily routines like traveling. What do you think about Atheist Republic? Armin Navib might be a nice guest. He was also Atheist Hangout. Um, or what about Julian Baggini? Thanks for your effort. Grokes. Uh, Grokes from, the Am Amps from Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Tosca. Right. So, yeah. He says, Tosca, I say Tosca. I don't know which one's right, but we got our bases covered. Yep. Thank you so much for listening uh, to yeah. all of our episodes. Seriously. Yeah. Good work. <laughs> that that second. Yeah. That first interview with Teresa McBain, episode two. Right. Our quality <laughs> was rough. Yeah. Sorry about that. We had no idea what we were doing. We still don't really, but it's okay. <laughs> uh, we, we've spent a lot of our, our listeners money on better hardware. Yeah. That I helps. think it helped. Yeah. But uh, guess. Yeah, sure. Hey, if you if you know Ar Armin or, or Julian, you know, please introduce us. Send us some some info. We'd love to. We're always looking for new guests. And you know what? Send us some pictures. Send me some pictures. Wesley at atheistnomads.com. I would love to see some some pictures of the Netherlands. Oh yeah, like the tulips. Uh, anything, seriously, anything. Beer. <laughs> just send the beer don't send pictures that'd be that'd be cruel <laughs> oh man <laughs> anyway if, if uh, you want to contact us you can always email us at contact atheistnomads.com you can call us at 541-203-0666 hit us up on facebook facebook.com slash atheistnomads or tweet us at atheistnomads and don't forget to use that lovely little Amazon button on the right side of our page. You know, um, if you want to do some purchasing, you know, Christmas is coming up. Uh, yeah, you click on that and Amazon will give us a little kickback and, you know, you'll be doing some good and you won't even see a see a cost. And we have no new patrons this time. <gasps> oh, no. OK. But you can always go to Patreon.com slash Atheist Nomads or hit up the AtheistNomads.com website and use one of the PayPal or Patreon links right there on the right hand side of the page. Appreciate it. 
And we will be back next week with an interview. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find us online at www.atheistnomads.com. Contact us at contact at atheistnomads.com or leave us a voicemail message at 541-203-0666. You can also like us on Facebook or leave us a review on iTunes, Zoom, or wherever else you find the podcast. Until next time, this has been the Atheist Nomads. I really need to update the outro. Yeah, I just heard Zoom. Yep. (laughs) It hasn't been called that in a couple years.